Well, what we have got to recognise is Keir Starmer and Sue Gray were particularly his focused... Chief of staff. His chief of staff, who was the head of proprietary and ethics at the civil service, have been very, very critical of Conservatives over exactly this. Now, if your position is that, well, these things happen and we should be thoughtful and flexible in our response, that's fine. But if, like Keir Starmer, you have been really aggressive in your criticism of Conservatives for this, then you've got to make sure that you are totally above reproach. And he has failed to do that. And so I think it's absolutely legitimate that we point out the hypocrisy of someone who basically got his job by criticising others for but what he is now doing. That's all a bit strong. When you say exactly this, you're not comparing the failure to declare some clothes with Partygate or Matt Hancock's behaviour or Tractorgate, are you? You're not, you're not seriously saying this is in the same category the point of, is, of transgression. So the point is, Keir Starmer has said over and over again that, you know, there, are, there, there is no flexibility, this is what you have to do, and he's failed to do it. And we are highlighting his hypocrisy, which I think is now showing a pattern of behaviour. The disregard he has got when we look at the hypocrisy appointment... Or just, or just no, no, inco tra tra in, 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 incompetent. There's another explanation, which is incompetence well, uh, on the part of neither, somebody in his office. Neither of which is a good look when you're seeking to run the country. So this is not just a one-off. We have got, uh, we have got uh, donors hosting, indeed, the same donor, uh, holding a pass to Downing Street for no particular reason, organising thank you parties on the right. government estate. We've got people running around the Department of Health, lobbyists who make money from understanding the inner workings of government, running around the you're, Department you're without a pass. You're referring to the former Health Secretary, Alan exactly. Milburn. A I whole think. load of other donors I... and supporters getting passes... I, I think getting you would passes, contest that description, by the way. ...getting passes as clearly a thank you, and the Labour government have been very critical of us, and we can discuss how valid those criticisms are, but this hypocrisy is being felt. It's being brought up with me right. when I knock on doors. All right, well, let's, let's um, talk about uh, the actual business of government, and uh, start, you were Foreign Secretary. I assume you would have gone to Washington and made the same case on Ukraine... Uh, as Keir Starmer did, which is to allow the Ukrainians to use British-made weapons to fire uh, missiles into Russia. Are you disappointed with the Americans' response? Well, when it was my responsibility, Ben Wallace, uh, when he was a Defence Secretary, and I lobbied very, very hard for the Western nations to donate main battle tanks to Ukraine. The UK led the field on that and other members of uh, NATO followed suit. We led the field when it came to the donation of uh, the long-range missiles that we're now talking about. That's had uh, a very, very significant effect in the Crimea. And I think it's disappointing that uh, Keir Starmer and David Lammy have failed to secure international agreement for Ukraine to use these missiles in their self-defence against the launch sites of those weapons that are currently hitting civilian infrastructure, energy infrastructure. Uh, it's complicated negotiations, but we've had a successful track record up until now, oh. and I really hope that they'll continue pushing on this. Well, what would you do if uh, you were still in government and the Americans don't change their policy, don't change their stance? You mentioned Ben Wallace. Uh, he and four other defence secretaries said this morning Britain should just go it alone and give the Ukrainians permission to use our missiles in the way that they want. Would you do that? Well, our job is to influence others. That's what we did when we were in government. That's what I did when I oh, was... No, our job, our job is to tell the Ukrainians how to use the weaponry we give them. And I'm just asking you, would you give them permission well, to as... use the weaponry in the way they want to? Well, my position on this is long-standing and clear. When I was in uh, Estonia um, in the spring of last year, I made it absolutely clear that it is not credible to demand that the Ukrainians defend themselves against these long-range missile attacks if they're not able to neutralise the launch sites of these missiles. So my personal position on this has been long-standing and clear. Um, we so have you got... would give them permission to fire on, on target in Russia 
if they threaten Ukraine. So the, yeah, so the point, of, Trevor, I've already said that I think it is untenable to demand of the Ukrainians they defend themselves against these missile attacks without giving them the opportunity to neutralise the launch sites of these missiles. These are legitimate military targets. They are the launch sites of missile systems and drone systems which are going against civilian infrastructure in Ukraine, including, uh, as we've seen, uh, schools, hospitals, as well as the energy infrastructure. So, so my position on this has been long-standing. And actually, it's because from my time as Foreign Secretary, but also my time as Home Secretary, that I recognise how dangerous and volatile the world is, that I have said the UK needs to spend 3% of GDP on defence to make sure that we are able to defend, our, defend ourselves and to support our allies, but most importantly, when it comes to the negotiations with other NATO allies, including the US, that we have real authority at the negotiating table because we are paying our way. Okay. And that gives us the opportunity to look the Americans or anyone else in the eye and say, we are pulling our weight. We need you to sign off on this. Uh, it, it sounds like we're already into leadership campaigning mode, so let me ask you about <laughs> that. Um, earlier this week, you said that you felt you might have been too diffident about your time, uh, your achievements in office. Um, so, a massive wave of migrants in small boats, a Rwanda policy that costs half a billion to send precisely zero asylum seekers nowhere, a loss of 251 seats. Uh, to paraphrase Winston Churchill talking about Clem Attlee, um, you're a diffident man with a lot to be diffident about. <laughs> I'm very proud of my record in uh, in office. As I say, when I was in uh, when I was in the foreign office, when I was foreign secretary, uh, I was the uh, first to visit uh, Israel after the brutal uh, terrorist attacks. I, uh, as I say, was instrumental in making sure that Ukraine had main battle tanks and uh, further support from the West. And when I was at uh, the Home Office, under my tenure, uh, the year-on-year -year figures showed that the um, uh, all the key metrics upon which we were measured, year-on-year uh, -year small boat arrivals, year-on-year -year asylum applications, year-on-year -year grant rates, year-on-year -year deportation rates, all these things were heading in the right directions. I, 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 made yeah. sure, I made sure that we sent foreign national offenders back to their country uh, of origin. Uh, we incarcerated yeah. people smugglers yeah. to, to, to uh, over uh, a total of 300 years of sentences. Yeah, the, so I did my job the, and I'm very this, proud of that. This, this sounds like a great school report, but look, at the end, you lot ended up with 250 seats down. So Trevor, we're and, in, uh, we're let, we're me just my, let me just finish my question. You ended 250 seats down, and surely the point of the leadership contest should, first of all, not to be to um, wave your, your medals, but to analyse why you had such a catastrophic defeat. And I've done that. Um, now, you haven't followed me around the country whilst I've spoken to the members of our party about what went... I regret wrong. that so much, Dave. You know, uh, but the, look, the point is, I, I said that we didn't... We, you know, we, we don't get everything right in government. No government does. We achieved a lot, but our achievements were obscured by, the, uh, by a lot of the infighting, a lot of the rowing, a lot of the bad behaviour that we've seen, which we need to get a grip of, and I've made the point that I'm best placed to do that because, you know, I have always uh, conducted myself in a way that I am proud of mm -hmm. and all that I would ask of others is that they follow suit. But the point is that every single person running in this leadership race has got a record in government they need to defend. My personal record is one that I am very comfortable defending because both at the Foreign Office and at the Home Office, I had a track record of success. And actually, yeah. I know this is a little bit party political, but when it comes to winning elections, I was the chairman of the party when we won that 80-seat majority. All right, let, let's talk about um, the policy. Uh, the big issue in the last week has been, or one big issue, has been the prisoner release uh, issue, which hasn't gone as well as I think the government would have liked it mm. to. But if you had been in government, you would have done exactly the no. same, wouldn't you? You'd... No. No? No. No, and look, this is... You, you, you would not have instigated the early release scheme? Not in the way that they have done it. And this is a really important point. We're seeing this with the winter fuel allowance and the prisoner release scheme. These are rookie errors by an arrogant and inexperienced uh, government. 
A civil. No, no, Trevor, no, whatever let me their explain. attitude is, so let me they're explain. dealing with a problem that you created. No, 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 let me explain the situation. You created it. Trevor, let me explain the situation here. The civil service and the Treasury have been trying to kill off the winter fuel payments for years. They present this as an idea to every incoming Chancellor and every incoming Conservative Chancellor has said no. Rachel Reeves has turned up, they've done the same thing to her as they've done to Conservatives, presented her with this toxic idea and she rashly said, yes, we'll do that, and they're now living with the consequences. With regard to prisoner release, again, these are proposals the civil service put in front of us and we rejected. I expelled foreign national offenders to free up prison places. We brought you were able to reject it because let, at the let, time you inherited it, you had hundreds of prison places spare. You left the country we with, kept, what, 100? We kept... In a, in a state of 89,000 places? We kept hundreds of prison places available through the actions that we took, including deporting foreign national offenders, including a better management of the system. Now, what's happened is the new government's come along, the civil service have pre presented the neat and tidy answer that they wanted, which we could see was wrong, and again, this naive and inexperienced government went for it, and we're now seeing the consequences where sexual offenders, where uh, domestic abusers, career criminals are being released in huge numbers, and it's backfired, which is why we had said no to it. The point is, okay. government is about decisions and choices. Okay. The Labour government have made catastrophically foolish choices, their priorities all right. are all wrong, and in let's, government let's, we were doing it very differently. Let, let's deal with a choice that you've got um, in the last part of this uh, interview. The real threat um, to Tories, aside from your record, uh, is reform. You said that Nigel Farage has no place in your party, there will be no deal. Mm. If you stand by that, uh, are you prepared to see the Labour Party in government for a decade because the right remains divided? No, this is... This, Trevor, your, your analysis is completely off. Completely off. The, the took four and a half million votes. The Conservative... Yeah, and, the, and what you do at elections... He made is, you lose. ...is you make the case to win those voters back. You failed. And I don't... You didn't win. You and didn't... I... Sorry, carry on. The point is, Trevor, at elections you make the case to win people back. And what happened is that we lost the confidence of voters. We need to regain that credibility. We need to have an honest conversation about the relationship between the, uh, the state, uh, the levels of taxation, the levels of immigration, and what we're going to do about it. The, the, the lazy idea that somehow cutting a deal with Nigel Farage will make all those problems go away, I think is naive at best and deeply counterproductive at worst. We need to make the case, the Conservative case for lower taxes, for more entrepreneurialism, for stronger borders, okay. for strong defence. And if we do that, the voters that went off to reform will come back, as will those that went off to the Lib Dems, the half dozen or so that went off to Labour, and the millions that just stayed at home. We can and we okay. should win those voters back by being ourselves, not doing some pale imitation of someone else. James Cleverley, thank you very much for your time this Cheers, morning. Trip.